This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today, we have a very special guest, Reynaldo Morales, joining us via Skype from Wisconsin. Reynaldo and I invite you, our viewers, to examine how individual and collective civic engagement can influence government's responsibility and obligations to ensure that social justice for indigenous peoples and nations take place. We will discuss an example of how public health laws and indigenous women's rights were revised in Peru in the 90s after thousands of indigenous women underwent forced sterilization and the elements that made these changes possible. Reynaldo is a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an academic researcher of Education and Environmental Studies Department. He's also a lecturer at the University of wisconsin Platteville, where he teaches history of the U.S. American Indian nations. On that note, thank you so much for joining us uh, right here from Hawaii, connection with Wisconsin. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. For the what a pleasure. So, um, Reynaldo, to those of our viewers who have never heard of you, would you mind giving a little bit uh, of information about your background? Where do you come from? How did you get to the United States? What are you up to these days? Well, I, I, I had a long professional academic life in Peru before coming to the U.S. I, I worked as a journalist and, and also as a filmmaker. Um, also researching lots of different uh, projects. I worked for public television um, and commercial television channels. I worked also for a major NGO working on strategic educational education where we started serving uh, different communities uh, around projects of uh, development, economic, social, uh, cultural, um, human rights, education, health, etc. One of the main um, or stronger areas that uh, we developed uh, work is in, in the areas of public health. Um, I moved into the United States in 2001. Um, I joined the University of Wisconsin uh, around 2008 or 9 um, and worked there. Yes, so 2007 actually. Um, and worked at the university and, and became part of the, the academia. Um, and for the last seven years, I, I completed a master's in, in education and started working in science education with the uh, Department of Biochemistry in a science education program uh, oriented to serve indigenous communities, tribal communities in the state of Wisconsin, where we have 11 tribes here. So it was a very fortunate coincidence for me because I had a long experience working with indigenous peoples in, in Peru um, and in the uh, South American uh, region. Uh, especially from the coast and from the Andes um, regions and chain, mountains chains, and also from the Amazonian rainforest in m many towns in, in the in different basins. So um, now I'm doing a research, and it's part of my doctoral research, related to environmental e education that in that is especially responsive and culturally relevant for indigenous people. So my interest is on issues of indigenous peoples, of course. Uh, from multiple and multidisciplinary um, perspectives, some of them education, but also public health, but also science education, the integration of knowledge systems, and issues of social justice are, are transversal to all our our um, academic interests. So I'm I'm very Im involved with many different groups, and I'm teaching, um, also doing workshops, and and writing now um, part of my dissertation. So it's it's, uh, it's a very busy and crazy time while teaching and doing different kinds of scenes. I'm, I'm filming a, a documentary right now because I'm a filmmaker. I developed uh, this career in, in, in the U.S. as well, serving indigenous nations, but uh, filming as part of the university as well. So now I'm filming a documentary for the Indian Community School. And today I have been busy interviewing um, key people, key indigenous people who were telling us the story of the emergence of these schools in the, since the late 1960s, at the time of school desegregation and racial desegregation in the United States. I was struck that when I was told that if I, if I was born here in the United States and in the Milwaukee area, when I was a kid at five, six years old, I would have to walk in a different uh, sidewalk, in the, in the different side of the street, because people of color 
had to walk at that time when I was a kid in the United States mm -hmm. in different street, in men, uh, different side of the street. You could not join the bus. You could not uh, drink in the same fountains, etc. So it was it was very, very uh, an amazing experience to hear that and make it a parallel with my own life. Mm -hmm. well, but absolutely. here I am. So uh, thank you for the invitation again. Oh, absolutely, Sir so, like, I cannot think of a more well uh, prepared person. Uh, professionally, spiritually, and also academically, to be able to bring up issues to your shopping list. related to um, social justice in indigenous people. So, um, as you know, our, our program really embraces uh, perspectives on global justice uh, from many angles, and indigenous peoples, you know, is definitely one area that we pay particular attention, not only because of the issues that, you know, unfortunately is very similar, you know, across the globe. Uh, and also a big part of our program's mission is to not only examine the, the barriers, but also to explore micro perspectives on solutions. And uh, uh, today, I think, uh, we will be talking a little bit about how public health and women's rights, indigenous women's rights in Peru uh, were changed and, and how you actually had you know, a big dent in that uh, process um, with your book, with investigation and journalism. Uh, but if you can give our viewers a perspective of what was happening with our Peruvian indigenous women and, and youth before, you know, you started doing your investigation so that people can have a little context uh, on how changes occurred. So be before doing the investigation about the forced sterilization practices, we worked for a year in a project about medical malpractice among um, the most uh, disadvantaged groups and, and women in poverty, uh, which is, well, you know, Peru is, is, is a place where you have extreme poverty. You have actually classifications, economic classifications from A to E and F in so many times. So you have the, the, the equivalence of social classes goes like five or seven uh, different is, is, is stratifications and then you have extreme poverty. So for these people, the, the public health um, and, and medical practice has been very unfair, and at that time we even had to uh, smuggle into some uh, public hospitals and maternity hospitals uh, cameras, so to interview people inside uh, and, and know many terrible, horrible cases where, where people were really, in many cases, people, women were forced to have uh, the C-section without needing it, only because doctors who were part of the, the medical system were uh, bad paid and they, they, they had to make their living, the, the surgeon and the anesthetic specialist. And they had to just uh, perform these, these dissections without the, the, the women need them. And, and for them, they didn't have any money to get a, get a bed. And in, in many cases, they had to rent a bed for uh, hours. And I, we, we follow the case of a woman who was already uh, declared, you know, that but she couldn't go because she had to pay an equivalent of 130, 140 bucks, uh, and she couldn't, she didn't have the money, so she was kind of kidnapped, and she had to sleep even outside in patios and halls with her baby, who, who her newborn baby. And with that, a well, that bad was the, was the system, from, and so we followed many of these cases, and after that. Uh, we served uh, uh, a women organization group, a feminist organization group who was doing these um, research and they wanted us to make a documentary. I work with the association TV Culture, it's called TV Cultura in Spanish, in Lima. And they followed these research based on witness accounts from people who were actually on the field at the time where uh, the lots of people in, in rural towns, indigenous women were gathered and by force, put in, 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 in trucks and, and locked in medical posts for one or two days. And one by one, they were uh, subject to two by ligation, forced to by ligation without their consent, 
without anesthesia, without any um, ma any medicine, not even painkillers or, or antibiotics to prevent any possible infection. So uh, they, the the result of the investigation by many different people who participated uh, could gather documents from the uh, from the government, from the Congress, who was receiving the quotes from the health department, uh, the, the the health ministry. Um, they were reporting the cases region by region, town by town, because the medical force, the, the corps, had a quote to fill. A uh, quota. There was a pressure for okay. the doctors and nurses to perform that. So at the end of, from the period of 1993 to 1999, there are more than 370,000 cases of um, forced sterilization, forced compulsory sterilization, uh, where the women were taken. Primarily with uh, indigenous uh, women? Yes, indigenous women in, in territories that, that are under contestation because uh, they want it for mining, they, they want the water, they, they uh, also, I don't, some of the motifs were, were to build, to break the, the, the family structure that because in the ag formal agriculture, um, indigenous agriculture really owns large extensions of, of, of fields and they don't hire any workers. They, the family really is the one who supports the, the, the and, and also members of the community. But if the family doesn't have kids and if they re you reduce the, the number yeah, of, ki of, of children in that family, you are really affecting the, the, the main socioeconomic activity uh, for the people who lived in that area for, for millennia. And you are breaking the, the economic sustainability of that region. So I think that was an, another um, motive. And now the, the president who, who did that is in jail right now. People, people uh, for many different reasons, but also for violation of human rights, of course, in many other instances. And so, some people went to jail. And, and the, the case went to uh, international court at Hague. And, and it was reopened in 2011. So it's still in course. The Peruvian government was um, in trial, and uh, our documentary served as a doc court document, actually. And it, it was a result of uh, community mobilization, individual mobilization, um, also um, women organizations, human rights organizations, and, and, and the, the contribution of uh, different researchers who gather this material. Without the participation of many different people on the field, and the commitment to put the information out and, and risk even their jobs, we wouldn't even know, because we we still lack of these similar reports on, on on the whole South American region. There are many reports that say that same thing has happened on the whole South American, Central American, North American region, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the South American region. You you have um, lots of people who have similar issues of poverty, extreme poverty in Bolivia and Ecuador and Colombia and in border areas in Brazil as well, so um, in Venezuela. So it's uh, in they, those cases were not probably documented because of the lack of articulation between the different forces on the field, like, like it was fortunately in the case of Peru. So wow. we, in, in we have only the, the documentation for six years. We don't know what happened before or, or a couple, two, three years after until the, the situation exploded. But mm -hmm. the, the reference of this case is important to bring because basically the mobilization of, of, of people, um, advocates, activists, and human rights organizations, women rights organizations, was key on revealing this stuff. So in my own experience, I see now that uh, mobilization, participation, advocacy, and, and articulation of different, different expertises and voices is key on advancing uh, issues of rights, uh, human rights in all, all across the globe. We have so many examples all across the world, right? Absolutely. Um, we're going to take a quick break and get back into a little bit more of the feelings behind the scenes as you were doing your work and working with all the social justice advocacy advocates to bring uh, light to all of these injustices um, in Peru. Thank 
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. I'm going to the game and it's going to be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink, but won't be drinking today because I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way because it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you want to be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says, let's go. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, right now. So welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Contelmo, and uh, we are talking with Reynaldo Morales uh, about uh, um, Aha Kuliana on behalf of indigenous people's social justice. And uh, in Hawaii, most people understand what Kuliana means, which is a very special word, uh, which means uh, the responsibilities that comes with privileges. And uh, on the first segment of our program, we got to get you know the view from uh, what was happening in Peru and uh, with public health and the forced sterilization of uh, poor, mostly indigenous women, uh, and how important it was uh, to be able to document these injustices and how to move forward uh, in a coalition uh, form to be able to bring justice and light to these issues and to make changes happen. So Reynaldo, here we are. I asked you before our break, um, what, you know, as you were uh, talking to people and women who just learned that they had unnecessary C-sections and had uh, uh, forced sterilizations. What was going through your mind and your heart as you were doing this work? Very hard to hear. We we were we know for a long time that there were lots of injustices in um, um, affecting indigenous peoples, and we, as you remember, Peru was one of the uh, countries that had a very violent uh, um, political violence process during 12 years, uh, two uh, guerrilla groups and uh, confronted the government. There was a lot of people to die. We have a heavy issues of uh, political violence in the country, mm -hmm. lots of protests, lots of um, political mobilization. So um, hearing once again that something that was, and I, I've, been, I've been through all these processes as a journalist, I, I saw so much things and especially in television. I was a journal, television in, uh, television journalist, not in paper, but always in television. So after, after seeing so much, seeing this last uh, episode of, of violence committing, committed against women who were um, really weak and um, uh, people who could not defend themselves, who were really trying to escape and ma didn't not participate in the political violence at all. They really tried to be part of their own land and, and, and just live among their communities and that, that they were taken by force. And we even had the one video of one witness 
Um, it was really, really uh, a time of desperation, but we had to really keep the calm. And I remember that for me, it was really horrible to see how much injustice and how much evil can be committed against uh, people who are, are, are in the... Vulnerable in the weak part of the society, people who were dis in disadvantage all the time, and once again, they were they were affected in their own bodies and the sanctity of their own bodies. And when we talk about women, it's their, their reproductive uh, rights, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's unthinkable, really. Very much so. So as a result of such atrocity uh, against indigenous people, but also women's uh, reproductive rights and their sanctity. Uh, one of the most beautiful um, gifts of being a woman, which is the ability to conceive and generate life. Um, good things happen. Uh, there were changes in public health and also in women's rights in Peru. So do you mind uh, giving our viewers a little perspective on uh, what happened, what kinds of changes were put in place as a result of this exposure? Well, um, the, the case is particularly important because the it came after the, 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 the same president who is now in jail uh, went to the Beijing Women Summit, Women Rights Summit, mm -hmm. and it happened after. He went as uh, one of the, to present Peru as one of the countries who was really the pioneer on women's rights, and at the end, um, it was the, the place where one of these atrocities, one of the highest atrocities against indigenous, against indigenous women were committed. Mm -hmm. and. So at the, at the time, the, um, the, what happened is basically it allowed a full revision of the medical system, of the medical services and the role of the state and, uh, and the role of, of protecting indigenous women uh, and the role of nurses. Because the, believe me, the nurses and the personnel who were also on the field were also indigenous. And we see these, at the time there are wars against countries, they use the indigenous peoples as the soldiers, as the scouts. Uh, they put them in right in front. Uh, and, and in Peru happened, uh, you know, women were really victimized in such a heavy way that they really gave their lives in, in the lives of many uh, generations that were unborn in order for us to see again and expose these issues and, and promote a whole reform of the medical system. So now you have that Peru is, does still have an, an imperfect system. They, they have the strikes all the time, but especially this issue of sterilization that it has a long history, not only in Peru, but around the world, has stopped. Apparently it has stopped. The women already know their rights. There has been a change on the discourse uh, and much of the justification from the health department was that uh, the plan was to reduce poverty. Apparently, this was a mandate from the World Bank that in order to lend more, uh, more money to Peru to increase the debt, they had to reduce poverty. But they reduced the poor, not the poverty. And it was just a case of eugenics. Exactly. So really, at the, its core, it was hidden on the economic reasons, but it was uh, bigotry and xenophobia mm -hmm. against indigenous people. And uh, I mean, my heart just just aches, you know, as I hear uh, this account. I um, I'm so grateful, you know, for the courage and the diligence and uh, the perseverance uh, that you and so many older professionals had during this very difficult time uh, in order to collect uh, the documentation that could be used as uh, evidence, you know, to bring light uh, justice and a different reality for Peruvian women, but also Peruvian culture and indigenous culture in Peru. Um, we were talking about uh, the importance of keeping uh, clarity 
of mind and spirit and also not allow the outrage and the anger to dominate um, our minds and our hearts you know in times of um, deep needs of change uh, in when there are social injustice happening so uh, do you mind leaving us uh, we're almost at the end of our program but um, a couple of uh, pearls of wisdom that you might have learned along the way uh, as a professional and as somebody who's deeply connected with indigenous culture on how can we uh, continue to walk uh, to promote uh, social justice not only for indigenous uh, peoples all over the globe but on any kind of social justice from that frame from that place of clarity transparency and peace um, I think one of the, the, the most important opportunities uh, to form our new generations and uh, also the present generation is to be aware of uh, changes that the world is experiencing today. So not to isolate ourselves and not to try to just hide from what, what is happening, but be very aware and try to connect and with uh, discussions among the communities, among our neighbors, on, uh, uh, in, the, in continue the, the path of dialogue with community organizations, hum, uh, human rights organizations, women rights organizations, indigenous rights organizations, schools, etc. So now is a time with, when parents and members of communities have to come out and participate in the dialogue in schools in every public space and continue this dialogue and try to influence the best ideas. In terms of indigenous peoples, we see a renaissance in the indigenous identity all across the world. Um, today I was just making this, uh, this interview where people told us um, how, how ashamed they were to, to tell the others and let other people know that they were indigenous. That change already, that, that people with, with lots of pride are telling others and revealing that they are indigenous, that they have a, an indigenous tribal affiliation or that they have indigenous ancestry. It's because, not because of the government or the corporations recognize indigenous. It's because indigenous people themselves uh, came uh, up front, continued um, uh, entirely the, the, their advocacy and the rebuilding of their world and their knowledge systems and their organization. Through these continuous and arduous processes, that is what we have now, that the indigenous peoples are rebuilding their own political, economic, educational systems, and they're now moving into environmental laws and affecting changes in international law through the United Nations Permanent Forum of Indigenous Issues and after the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2015. So we see these changes, and now we need the people to participate in this dialogue and not just isolate the politicians, the academics, or the researchers, or the advocates, but we need that these processes are continued from the base. And that's, that's what I, I hope that in this new time, uh, especially with this so much divisive climate, uh, indigenous peoples can learn the lessons from history and go back to the, the, or the roots and, and create coalitions that will, will, will last longer for our seven generations ahead. Right. And uh, that is a beautiful message to uh, share with our viewers and to uh, government officials from all over the globe uh, and also the community in general as far as not just the challenges but the amazing invitations that we have ahead uh, of us you know now and moving forward to make a more socially just and equitable uh, also for indigenous peoples and uh, indigenous people also need to be a part of this conversation and of this process and the decision making process right so on that note i want to thank you so much for joining us today for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us and i hope that this may be the first of many programs that we do together uh, on indigenous people's issues from you know very different lenses so that uh, we can continue to collaborate and learn and appreciate each other and one another it will be my pleasure Bea and I, I really salute the effort of the, the, the producers and the organizers of, of this wonderful program and I hope that they continue and, and, and you you can invite me anytime you want and I, 
I will be always pleased to participate. Thank you so much. Again. Thank you so much. We're Gracias. Well, this concludes uh, today's uh, Perspectives on Global Justice program. Thank you for much for, so much for watching us, and uh, I hope to see you again next Friday, uh, who we hope.